Hey everyone, uh, Rob Simone here, Reed Sector Head at, uh, at Hedgeye. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, have a, an interesting an interesting and timely conversation today. It's uh, having the folks from Armada ETFs back. Um, obviously, uh, Phil Back, who's the CEO, David Auerbeck, who I've known for, uh, for several years, and, and Al Otero, who's the portfolio manager of a new product that um, Armada just launched recently that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, yeah, you know, like we, we've had the Armada guys on before to talk about um, th their views as to what's happening with private REITs. Obviously, that's an ongoing situation. And uh, so we think it's, it's timely and topical. And so uh, guys, uh, maybe Phil, starting with you, like maybe introduce yourselves, like say for the folks who didn't, you know, watch the last webcast, just say like what you guys do at, at, at Armada, um, give us a little spiel and then we'll, uh, we'll move right into it. All right, Phil Box, CEO of Armada. Thanks, Rob, for uh, having us on. It's great to be on. Um, big fan of, of Hedgeye and everything you guys do. Uh, we are a REIT specialty asset manager. We have a couple ETFs that are out to market. We do some uh, private funds with, uh, with some AI technology specific to REITs. Everything we do is in REITs. Um, and we've been looking at this issue for quite a while. Um, it's quite, quite frankly, it's one of the most fascinating things that I've seen in my career, and I'm excited to jump into it. Cool, cool. How about you, David? You go next, and then we'll go to Al. Sure. <clears throat> Great to see you, Rob. I've uh, been in the REIT industry for close to 25 years now as an institutional trader and a sales trader. I'm the publisher of the Daily REIT Beat newsletter, which goes out to uh, several hundred institutional investors, C-suite executives, sell-side research analysts, but it's one of the most widely read go-to daily publications covering the REIT industry. Uh, and uh, I've uh, been lucky to network and know pretty much all of these REIT guys for many, many years. And so we have a very deep uh, network of REIT connections spanning across the globe here. Cool. Thanks, David. Uh, Al Otero here, uh, Portfolio Manager at Armada. I joined the team about 18 months ago with the launch of, of House, our, our, our first uh, uh, ETF, um, which is uh, focused on residential uh, uh, REITs, and uh, now also portfolio manager for for PRVT, the newest uh, newest launch. Uh, by way of background, I uh, spent 30 years in the REIT industry, uh, 26 of those with a firm called EII Capital, and uh, great to, mm -hmm. to be here and uh, be part of the conversation. Oh, I didn't know you were at EII. That's that's interesting. Um, old uh, longtime client, a different firm. So so welcome. Thank you. Um, a couple guys, you know, in the read industry, everyone's like gone to firms that we all know. So <laughs> it's good to uh, reconnect with folks. So, so guys, world, thank very you very small much. Universe. I know it's uh, it's amazing. It's like you see the same faces, just at different firms. Um, everybody mm -hmm. uh, kind of like a, a small corner of the world, which is fun. Um, but anyway, all right. So let's get into it. Like I thought, uh, obviously, well, so actually, just just this week, right? We saw another portfolio company sale out of Beery to uh, to PSA, um, which is interesting. I, I personally thought it was a really great deal for PSA. It has like a value add component to it. Um, they weren't paying a fully, you know, a full price or a low cap rate for a fully stabilized asset. And like their leverage is still low. And so they can effectively fund it with debt. And then on the other side, you have Kind of the situation where like maybe there's a very willing seller <laughs> maybe it maybe in air quotes and be read um so it, it set it like in my view it's setting up to be a really interesting deal for psa and exactly what they should be doing but i don't know maybe phil like what what's your view of kind of what's going on under the hood at, at be read right now and at blackstone because it's obviously something people care about a lot yeah it's it's pretty fascinating you know it's, it's a classic story right the victim of their own success they were remarkably successful, bringing in a billion dollars a month over the life of the fund uh, with incredible performance, which you know we'll talk about may or may not be uh, a mirage. It, it is unbelievable performance in, in the most literal sense, right? Where, where it is not to be believed. Um, but they've had a tremendous amount of success and success breeds hubris. Hubris breeds disaster. And we are now one CPI print away, one bad CPI print away from complete and total capitulation where you've got this perfect storm of, you know, redemption requests coming out of BREIT, um, frozen liquidity mm -hmm. in the in the you know in the commercial real estate market, and you know increasing cost of capital. It's all coming together at once. So BREIT needs liquidity. They they got to sell, right? And and you know this deal is interesting because what 
you know, one of the themes that we're talking about and something that we're seeing is you've got these publicly traded REITs that are moving along mark to market. They're getting beat up with every downturn, but they're moving along. Their balance sheets are strong. They're well capitalized. You're starting to see public REITs eating the private REITs. And this deal is just, you know, one of those of a long line of those. But we are not out of the woods with B-REIT, not by a long shot. We are closer to the beginning than the end. And when I say B-REIT, mm-hmm. it's B-REIT at all. It's also S-REIT. It's also, you know, many of these other private REIT funds. Uh, we're still at the very beginning of this story. And uh, I think investors need to, you know, really pay attention, um, you know, potentially, if they're worried about it, get in the queue for the redemption, because it's going to be a long queue, um, and really keep their eye on what's happening here in the market. Sure. So, so we're like, okay, so a lot of interesting points there. Um, you know, it, it, you know, the, the more things change, the more they, they stay the same, right? Like I remember um, when BREIT was, was really coming on the scene, it, in many ways at the time, it, it made sense. And I guess like, there was, and, and again, not 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 just to pick on B-Read, it, you could put many of these like relatively liquid closed end funds in this category that were, um, you know, m- m- maybe marketed to folks that they shouldn't have been, but that that's like more of the end point. I guess, I guess in your guys' view, where did things kind of go astray for them and and for the industry in general? Like, what what was the point at which, or the the catalyst, or the the point of no return where like everyone kind of went over to the dark side and and the fate was sealed. You know, there's, there's a thing in finance. I was like, Oh, past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Okay, fine. People could say that people can really believe that they could believe buy low, sell high. The fact is the fact, right? The intrinsic, you can prove people performance chase, the market performance chases Mm -hmm. and money comes in at the worst possible time for every strategy. Right. You look at ARC, you look at her, you know, her performance over time and you look at the average investor return on that performance. And that diversion is one of the most amazing charts I've ever seen because everyone came in after her incredible run of performance. People come in at the worst possible time. And this is no different. The success that Blackstone had in his fund led to more and more flows coming in at the worst possible times, at peak real estate valuations, at peak NAV and Mark's. You know, some money's coming in and they have to put it to work. And, um, you know, they, they did. They put it to work at a time when um, when rates were, you know, a level that we're probably not going to see for some time when, when, you know, valuations of the real estate that they were buying was quite high. And now they're they're in this problem where, you know, money wants to come out. They're trying to be stubborn with the NAVs. And we'll talk about how and why and the mechanics of that um, and what their incentive is on that. But, you know, it is ultimately their own success that led to the money coming in. That led to the money coming in at the worst possible time because of the structure of the fund. They have to put it to work, you know, and, and, and here we are today. Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, guys. Yeah, sorry. I uh, put my phone on mute. Um, so what, and, and this is like a, a question for everyone as well. So um, chime in as needed, but like, what's, what's your guys' view as to, um, kind of the the motivations around so so my understanding is that like there was a an additional uh, sorry an initial investment minimum right that was more akin to like an accredited investor that gradually kind of got sized down over time um and effectively moved the BRE product like like not I don't, I'm not down the chain but like further out into the, like the retail distribution pipeline effectively and and so like my under and our understanding ahead like we we you know we speak with RIAs all the time RIAs are many of our clients. Um, there's so many people that are in this that like can't get out right now or or like you know RIAs that are trying to do the best by their clients um, to like maximize effectively like their their recovery for for lack of a better word. And and I guess like what what's your th- what what's your thought about why and how that happened and like what would be your advice to those folks both their advisors and the people at home um from this point going forward because obviously like there are things that can't change like people are locked in and to some degree and now it's about like maximizing their outcome so like sit, sitting here what would you guys do so i'm doing all the talking here so i'll, I'll let david now jump in in a minute but, yeah, but yeah. i just want to i just want to kind of you know hit this up a little bit that i think you know, the, the idea, the concept of democratizing these assets and taking, you know, private equity style investing or taking commercial real estate that had mm-hmm. been illiquid, bringing it to everyday investors, 
I think that's a good thing, right? It's a net good. You're creating mm-hmm. liquidity. Sure. Um, you're giving people access to that's more. Why access. Exi- that's why REITs exist. That's why yeah, the whole exactly. industry exists. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's great. Um, but I think that, you know, the smoothing effect that we see with every private investment that we see with this is is very real. And I'm not sure that in all the, you know, wirehouses in particular and all the models that uh, there's been enough of an adjustment for that smoothing effect to manage for not the measured volatility, but the you know the future volatility, right? Risk is forward looking. Risk is what I haven't mm-hmm. experienced yet, right? And I think um, you know optimizers. When you look at the dividend payout, which I you know I'd love to get into this too because the dividends are a bit of a mirage here, and it's very in a very you know it's a very unique structure here. But I am look- I am on the leading edge of telling people that dividends are a mirage, and and right now I, I look like an idiot, but that there are periods of time where you. You look like a genius when you make that call. There are other periods of time when you're like, you know, the yield chasers appear to be right. Like we're kind of in that that inflection where, you know, 13% dividend yield suddenly makes sense. Like I would just argue that's ridiculous. So be warned. But yeah, I, I, I hear you. Believe me. <laughs> yeah. But in, and in this case in particular with this fund, you know, the, the dividends are calculated off the AFFO. It doesn't even include their right. fees to their and they're converting their fees into uh, yep. into iShares. So, you know, you have you have a lot going on. Luckily for, I mean, they can't make the full dividend payout pay out here in cash. You never have been able to, but most people are taking their, they're reinvesting the dividends as shares. However, if we establish that the NAVs are inflated, you're getting a lot less dividends than you think. But this is kind of deeper, sure. you know, let, let me let me step back to it, to an outer layer of the, of the onion here. Um, the realized volatility of this thing has been, you know, completely non-existent. There's been no volatility. It basically looks like levered treasuries. I mean, it's almost a linear line up and to the right here. On the, so a lot of portfolios have optimized this thing into, you know, portfolios almost as a bogey for fixed income for the lowest mm-hmm. of low risk investors. You know, and 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 now we're staring at what we think we're staring at the precipice of a thirty percent NAV drawdown. For reasons we can get into, and um, it's unfortunate because it's the wrong investors that are in this in many cases. But you know, there are there are options. There are public uh, options now. We have a fund that's a direct competitor. We'll probably talk about that. I want to let David mm-hmm. now. Talk as well. um, just I'll, I'll jump in. It's it's, it's uh, Robin. Just to, to your first point, I guess in terms of um, uh, how these things are marketed. I mean, my impression is 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 that uh, these these NTRs, these non traded REITs, this newer class. Uh, following collapse of the industry in kind of 2015, uh, that that era uh, were almost purpose built for the retail investor. Uh, if you think back to that time, I mean, we we came up with distribution rates. Phil touched on the distribution of 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 these entities, and they don't come close to being covered by recurring cash flow. I think part of the the nomenclature was okay. We're providing. Uh, we're going to provide institutional quality real estate to the masses, as you alluded to. You know, the public REITs. Been doing have been doing that since you know since 1992 uh, with the modern REIT era and and Kimco Realty. So we really had a vehicle out there. I think with with this group really latched onto was also combining um, uh, uh, this democratization of real estate with um, with the with the evolution and and demand for alternatives. And the the, the, the the non-correlation with uh, with with listed with, with listed vehicles, uh, the, the 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 distribution rates that were that were higher than you can get in in most other places, and really the, the, it was the culmination of all of this that created these massive inflows, uh, and then led to led to eventually uh, uh, you know a, a period of investment activity at a time you know post pandemic. Uh, or, or intra-pandemic, when interest rates were zero, money was free, and all these entities uh, by design had to put all this capital to work uh, in a very short period of time and at very aggressive pricing. And now we're left with the uh, uh, with the indigestion, mm-hmm. if you will, of, of, of that period today. So a very interesting case study, and I'm, I'm sure it will be uh, uh, studied for many years to come. Mm-hmm. Dave, do you have anything you want to add to that? Or I was just going to note that, you know, just in the past several weeks, we've seen, you know, four or five new non-traded REIT fund filings come to market as well, led by Invesco, uh, which is a household name. We see the commercials on TV every single day. And so regardless of the hiccups that we've been talking about, as we're seeing in some of the space, it isn't preventing new issuers from coming to market offering investors these products. And so I feel like with what we're seeing in the market here, it's still just still showing that pent up demand for investor interest in these hard assets. 
Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, like uh, maybe just to put a period on that point, you know, Keith, our, our founder, talks about th this and many other things that we've we've seen over the past, call it eighteen months, um, as just another, maybe another manifestation of kind of like, you know, um, uh, you know, rate race in and then go trail out when liquidity comes out of the market, right? Like it, it's like the the mm -hmm. wide end of the funnel and then like the bottom end of the funnel, and the wide end only works when there's ample liquidity in the market and like right now we're seeing here and elsewhere kind of the the manifestation of when liquidity truly comes out i'm like what does that mean for people um and uh, unfortunately the wide end existed for like 12 years 13 years and now it's uh it's kind of you know reversing faster than any of us have seen in a long time so um anyway so no, I guess nobody like, thinks when about got, liquidity risk. Nobody thinks about liquidity yeah. risk in, in the good times. You know, it's just something, you know, everyone just assumes, oh, there's so much to put it in. Everyone just assumes it's always going to be there. And, you know, there, there are several assets. There are several assets that are at risk yeah. to uh, to facing this kind of issue. And uh, by the way, look, not, not to pick on um, non-traded REITs in totality. I mean, th there are many REITs, publicly, like publicly traded REITs, and, and David and I have, talked about several of them personally on other and on other webcasts that um, you know can condition their models and their capital structures for a a cost of debt capital specifically that um, you don't want to say fictitious because the, the reality is they had access to it but what what was not well thought out was like okay um, the, the the unlevered yields that we're buying into, the term of those yields and then also the amount just like the absolute dollar debt that we're attaching to it Do, like does that th does that create a sustainable model and like there, there are many publicly traded reefs I, I could rattle off a dozen that are just not built to survive that and and we're not we're not talking about like resetting you don't, you don't have to set the recost reset the cost of debt from three to eleven if you set the cost of debt from three to seven many of these models go away, right? And like, I would make an argument that that's where we are. So anyway, sorry, I'm saying too much. Al looks like you want to say something. Well, no, I, I, I agree with you. I, th I think we're better, we've gotten better, uh, you know, thinking back to the GFC and what, what a lot of the industry went through back then. And I think we, we learned a lot of lessons. So I, I think we're, we're a much improved industry post GFC, Rob, but absolutely, you're, you know, you're always going to have the, you know a, a yeah. segment of the, a segment of the of the end of an industry that is just built for um uh you know fair weather right for the for, for fair weather and then when the tide goes out yeah. then, then then you figure out you know uh, uh you think back to to Sam Zell and how he built his companies right to 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 to, to survive and sustain themselves yeah. uh, in any type of period and not not all companies have have built themselves around around those those, those basic principles absolutely yeah. So, well, so I disagree line. with that, and you know we're we're okay. one company, but we're we're different individuals, and and you know we we sometimes come to different conclusions. <laughs> just as I'll just posted a, a blog post on our site that I also disagreed with on the UC thing, but you know usually I'll defer to Al. Usually Al's right, but I'll give you my my probably wrong view anyway. Um, you know he said that <laughs> we learned a lot of lessons from from the global financial crisis. We're in a better place. I think we didn't. I think we're in a significantly worse place. I think the only lessons mm. that we learned. Is that the Fed has our back? Is that there's a Fed put that the Fed is going to keep rates artificially suppressed indefinitely, and that they can do that without any cost of inflation risk? And I think now we're just starting to see that that's not the case. That there is true inflation risk. This MMT stuff is a bunch of garbage. It can only do QE and ZERP for so long, and ultimately it's going to come back to bite us. And I don't think we've even had. I mean, everyone is taking it as as just a given that oh no, it's it's a sure thing that rates are going to be right back down. Is it just wait, just wait it out. This is a little blip rates are going to be right back down. It is no sure thing. And I'm not saying that we're in hyperinflation. We're going to be, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, yeah. but neither do the Keynesians who are just assuming we're going to be back at ZERP. There is no guarantee we can go either way from here. And if we go up in terms of rates from here, like you said, Rob, there is a whole lot of yeah. assets, and a whole lot of asset classes that are going to be wiped out. Yeah. And by the way, Phil, you, you sound like you work at Hedgeye. Um, we, <laughs> uh, Keith, Keith, Keith would love, we're, we're probably going to snip that, uh, I imagine, because Keith, Keith would love that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like just from a macro perspective, like we're, we're actually seeing, like no one's talking about this. Suddenly everyone's declaring victory over inflation, but like underneath the yeah. surface, inflation's reaccelerating. So what, what does that mean? Right. Like people are not thinking about like, 
the, the length of time that this can persist. Um, so anyway, yeah, no, I, that, that's really good perspective. So maybe like moving in. Oh, sorry, David, go ahead. You're putting your hand up. Go for it. <laughs> I'm just going to add, I'm not picking sides on this. I just think to, to echo what Al was trying to say, though, I think when he's mentioning mm-hmm. lessons learned, you know, the REITs going into GFC back, you know, and even, you know, 08, 09, their leverage ratios were extremely high. They were not well capitalized. They oh, were, pre- pre- preposterous, preposterous. And so like just, I, I think yeah. looking back to my days at Green Street, when Mike Kirby, the CEO of Green Street, put out a publication urging all REITs to go to 25% leverage or less, he was mm-hmm. laughed at. He was mocked across the industry by both the analysts, the companies, the investors. They're like, what are you, crazy? That's never going to happen. Go look yeah. at the REIT balance sheets today. And that's what I think Al was implying is that well, th- these guys have very low leverage ratios that they're able to weather some of these financial storms unlike what they faced back then. Right. Well, my comment was was, was specific to the REIT industry, industry David. Yeah, that, that's that's correct. And then and I'm yeah. definitely referencing the the, the, the the leverage levels today. You look at pri- our fund, our private uh Rob, which we'll get into later, you know, I'm sure later. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're at a debt to, debt to gross asset value of 26% in, in our that, in our that, port, portfolio. And then those those are yeah. leverage levels that again, you know. 10, 15 years ago were, were, were not the norm in the industry. There are always going to be those bad actors and bad players out there uh, uh, in, in the listed space as well as a non-traded space. But um, you know, what we've tried to accomplish with private is, is giving investors a, uh, a, a liquid portfolio of traded REITs um, that, that uh, in, some, in, in many cases approximate the geographic profile of what you can get from these non-traded REITs, which by the way, have very smart sponsors and, 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 and do a really good job of allocating uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, very interesting investment themes. Uh, and we just think we can, we can get that to the end user, to the investor at a, at a, at a discounted valuation at a discounted fee structure. And then that's really what uh, what we're talking about with, with uh, uh, and the genesis of, of, of why we came up with PRVT. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And, and also like maybe one, one final point on this, um, the last cycle where a lot, what well, the craziest thing about the last cycle is a lot of that leverage existed in some of the shorter duration sectors. Like you guys remember where lodging was, right? I mean, lodging, like, I mean, just absolute, Crazy, yeah. Like like a suicidal approach, um, and and this ha- I'm glad you're well. Investors should be glad you're saying that because like your fund when, again we can talk about this in the end, but like there's some pretty short duration stuff at the top of your fund or on the shorter end of the curve if you look across like the entire REIT space, like Resi for example. So it's it's important that investors kind of understand like your how you're thinking about that. But w- with that said, I mean kind of the the next you know next topic. Um, I guess when, when you look at one of, one of the things that Phil and I and, and David exchanged emails on as we were getting ready for this uh, is just kind of like the obviously, you know, many, many public REITs kind of like exist at a, at a perpetual discount to NAV. I, I would I would make an argument like we calculate our NAVs a little a little differently than most of the street. I would make an argument that most of the time those NAVs are like dramatically overstated and that the, the public markets are right or at least forward looking about where they're at least about where they're headed but but now we kind of have this um this really interesting kind of like parallel universe over here where uh at least reported navs <laughs> for the for the private reads and obviously they're calculated on a lag you know they're they're moving in the in the mid to low single digits you know downward whereas apartments are off what 25 30 percent year over year um and and you kind of look at that and investors say well like how how is that possible and like what kind of what how how does that gap narrow and which side drives the narrowing like like is the public market right or is the private market that's being more conservative in the way they're marking down their portfolio are they right like who and what kind of squares that circle so, you know, the public markets are voting with their dollars, right? So they're standing with a bid that they're willing to stand behind with their own money. And the private markets are uh, backed by appraisals based NAV, which in some cases are, are lagging. It could be lagging by, you know, up to a year. So would you trust somebody who's who's willing to buy something with a standing bid ahead of dollar or some appraiser that's getting paid by Blackstone 
who you know is visiting the property once a year, I'd probably go with the I'd probably go with the guy voting with his dollar, right? I'd probably I'd probably trust that one. Um, I would suggest you should as well. And you know the thing about it is, over time we've seen historically the public and private REITs, uh, the the NAVs diverge and then converge, diverge and then converge. Right now we're at the widest ever divergence between the two. And you know we we do see the convergence happens now. The question is, you know, does that kind does that convergence mean that the the privates drop or the public spike or some combination of the two? You know, we we can't say. We don't know. Whatever you know, in any scenario though, in any scenario of those combinations, you're going to wish that you were in the publics, not the privates. I mean, right now VNQ is about 16 percent off its all time highs. BREIT is still very close to its all time high. You know, so so mm-hmm. there is an opportunity. There is a bit of an RB. It's not a full R because you can't, you know, you can't short the the privates. But there is no question that there's a, a discount to be realized by buying the publics. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I'll just, yeah, I know for sure. So go for it. Sorry, Al. No, sorry, Rob. I was just going to add to that. We did a post a couple of a uh, couple of weeks ago, about, uh, you know, piggybacking on some some research that Nareed had done. Uh, you know, going back and looking at the performance of. Uh, of, of the NAREED index relative to um, uh, to to, uh, uh, to Odyssey, um, uh, NAREED Odyssey, uh, going back uh, about about twenty five or thirty years, and there were eight periods of, of pretty major dislocations, if you will, and uh, the largest of those dislocation periods being the one we're, we're living through right now. And of the prior seven periods, uh, we've seen uh, REITs go on to outperform by by a, a very large margin. Uh, and a lot of mean reversion, and, and that mean reversion has been commensurate with the degree of the dislocation. So I would make the case that if we, you know, if if if, if, we, if we believe in history, if we believe in in the power of mean reversion, uh, I think we we are in for a a, a period of of public market uh, outperformance based on the history that we that that we've seen. Again, history doesn't always play out perfectly, but. Uh, you know, cl- clearly, that gives me some level of confidence, and now's a pretty good time to be focusing on the, the, the on, on the listed REIT category. Mm-hmm. So, so we ran our own valuation models on on BREIT uh, a few different ways. Do, do you want to get into that? Do you want us to show you our, our numbers? Yeah, yeah. If you're willing to, no, that'd be great for folks. And um, obviously, like we, uh, you know, we we have not done that or published that at, at Hedgeye. And to the extent you're willing to, to share, I mean, I'm sure investors would really value that. Um, can we bring up a slide or? Uh, or we don't have uh, let me. Yeah, I, 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 I just need to share the screen. Hold on one second. I don't. Uh, let me just see if guys in the studio, maybe can you enable David's um, screen to share if possible? And give us a heads up if and when that's uh, that's ready. If not, we can. Well, why don't as we wait for the heads up? It's not like a talk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of you. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah, they're telling me we can't. So why don't you guys talk to it? Okay, yeah. that's fine. Should I jump in, guys, and start this yeah, off? Yeah, please. Or? Yeah. Okay, sure. So look, I, I, you know, we talked about you know earlier. You you made the, the comment, uh, Rob, in terms of, of what made us kind of kind of you know take a look at this, and and you know uh, I mentioned earlier our initial. Uh, foray into into ETFs at, at Armada was was house, which is a residential centric product. And obviously, um, again, for discussion purposes, I'll, I'll talk about BREIT. But again, you can you can replace them with one of the uh, you know some of the other NTRs because they're the biggest, most you know, you know high profile. You know, they're the one we primarily focused on, and uh, you know they're you know over fifty percent invested in, in in residential REITs. So we were looking at their valuation, their implied cap rate. We built it. Uh, we built we built out a, a quarterly NAV for the company, and uh, started comparing it to the implied cap rates that our residential REITs in house were trading at. And we said, oh my God, you can drive a truck through these uh, disparities in, in in implied cap rates. So uh, one of the slides we like to show in our in our in our uh, uh, marketing deck is um, mm-hmm. is, is various uh, implied cap rates for BREIT uh, based on based on where we think the market has has uh, has, has moved towards you know, relative to where our our uh, uh, residential REITs are trading. So just to give you a little bit of a of a flavor, um, uh, you know, we peg BREIT currently trading at about a, a kind of a low fours implied cap rate, call it about a four three implied cap rate on their NAV on their most recently published NAV. 
Um, we think that private PRVT, uh, if you do a blended implied cap rate on our portfolio, is more like a, a 575. So you, you would right. put a 575 imply, uh, cap rate for, for BRE, given the 50% leverage, guess what? Your, 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 your 14 and change dollar uh, uh, stock in BRE goes, goes down just below $8 a share. So again, you know, just to give a sense of, of the uh, of, of the valuation gap between between the between the two uh, between public versus private, it gets you know also gets to uh, the discussion I mentioned earlier with, with NARIT's uh, analysis and say, wow, the, the gap between between non traded and uh, you know private funds and public funds are are so, so wide today, and we can we certainly uh, uh, could, could could validate that fact with the uh, just looking at at uh, a name like B read sure. relative relative to uh, uh, to a portfolio of listed names. I, I, I want to make sure that's not lost on the audience that when you use our cap rates, which we can defend, which you know we're we're open book on this, the NAV on BRE drops by forty five percent. I want to make sure that's not lost. Forty five percent. Yeah, yeah. That's the level that we that that's the that's a discrepancy that we see. Um, so uh, I guess my question, yeah, so th that's good to know. And that's a useful, really useful data point for folks. And, and I mean, obviously it's, it's not publicly traded. So like that would, that would manifest if that were applied, it would manifest itself over time, right. In, in either the distribution rate or the wind down and the realization upon a sale, like w whatever the resolution event is. But I, I guess like people hear that, like I hear that as, as a REIT analyst and like people who follow the REIT space here, 150 basis point delta between what effectively is implied by, you know, the, the public markets in the, in the public market apartment REITs and like what you guys see in, your, in the, I guess, the, the resi share of your portfolio versus what B Reader, S Reader, any of these guys, how, how do they, so it's on a lag, it's appraisal based, but how do they justify that? Like, how, how does that, like, what is the rationale for, what logical or, like, common sense reason could you possibly come up with to say, like, that is okay? They buy great properties. They do a very good job of managing those properties. They're in the hottest areas. So they're in the south and the west. They're in residential. They're in industrial. Uh, and, and, you know, by all accounts, they buy great properties. The beauty of it is, though, we can also buy the south and the west and residential and industrial using the public markets. We can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They are tremendous capital allocators. We're not taking that away. Sure. From them. There's no question Absolutely. about that. But we can apply their same allocations, right, using publicly traded REITs and, and taking advantage of better valuations. So, you know, and, that, and that's what we've done, right? That's to us. Mm -hmm. That is the that is the arbitrage. That is the smart thing. And I mean, wouldn't the, isn't that a smarter approach that would allow you to sleep better at night? You know, so we have an ETF. It's it's new. It's small. It is going to give you the same concepts, the same allocation, the same fundamental allocation that you would get from them, but it's going to give it to you in uh, a vehicle that is liquid, that you can't gate, right? That is significantly lower on fees. There's no selling commissions or embedded, uh, you know, selling fees. There's no performance fee with none of this 125 basis point management fee. We bring it way down. Um, and, you know, we we think it's it's simply, you know, you're taking the best of both because they are tremendous allocators they are and they've got mm -hmm. you know excellent cost of capital and and marginal efficiencies and you know that we can't take those things away from them and they've proven that and they've done a very good job but for that in order for that for those factors to be better than for them to be able to outperform the public markets year after year um they have to be better than the 350 basis point give or take depending on the share class depending on what the performance mm -hmm. be in any given year. But historically, it's been about 350 basis points. They have to overcome a 350 basis point hurdle that is itself compounding year after year. Are they that right, good? Right. Is anyone that good? I don't think so. That's impossible. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's yeah. it's frankly, it's not sustainable. Um, we don't think it's sustainable, but there are, I mean, there are good reasons why people have been, you know, bullish on why they've done a great job year to date. You know, we just think that, the structural disadvantage that they put themselves in because of this fund structure and because of their onerous fees has just, you know, led them to a point where, you know, they, they frankly can't keep it up. I, I, I would just add to that, Rob, also, again, and these come, they're not saying, look, we're, we're, we're marking to market. They're saying, look, you know, they're, they're primarily, they're doing appraisals, they're doing DCFs yep. and their, their, their monthly DCFs, you know, have, haven't changed, right? They're, they're, they're still saying we see growth, uh, in, in NOI, and uh, I think I think B reads most recent was a seven percent 
uh, a growth. Uh, uh, we don't know how far out they're going with it. They don't tell us that, but it's down from 9%. So they're still assuming very, you know, very strong growth across their portfolio. We know, we know in, in, in the real world that we live in, well, rent growth is, 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 da- is down to about you know, m- maybe 2%, 2 to 3% for, uh, for, for, mm-hmm. for apartments overall. Uh, so so you know, they're, again, they're operating on a different time horizon. And, t- and that that you know that that that, that matters in, in terms of how they're looking at valuation. So uh, and they're not doing anything different per se than uh, than their 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 peers are doing, or that that that's going on ac- right across the the, the spectrum of, uh, of, uh, of 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 private vehicles. But it's clearly a, a you know it's 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 not a mark to market type of, of exercise that they're uh, that they're working through. Whereas in, in listed world, right, we're a discounting mechanism and right. much more of a of a, of a mark to market in terms of, of how of how securities are, are being priced. Right. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to put you guys on the spot a little bit. Maybe two two more questions on B REIT and S REIT, and then um, we can talk about uh, PRVT, et cetera, um, which is which is your guys' business and like how you thought about it. But so two two questions, I guess. If if you're forced to ask this for answer this first question, excuse me, what would be the one advantage those structures have over PRVT? So that'd be question one. If you had if you had to pick an advantage or two, like where do they have an upper hand? And two, um, do you guys think that they have not like let's just take this family of vehicles? They have not been covering. You kind of alluded to this before, but not been covering their distribution with internal uh, distributions plural with internally generated cash flow. And and if so. How does this, like, what is the resolution here? What is the outcome? How does this whole thing kind of like come to a head and resolve itself? So two questions, but I, I, the floor is yours. Anyone want to uh, jump in? Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> Load, loaded questions. So, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't, don't want to dominate. I want to let other people. I'm talk happy to, yeah, I'm yeah. happy <laughs> to start off. There's one, the one big advantage is, is look, they, they, they get to, they get to, they don't have to mark to market, right? They're, 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 they're marking, marking to, to, uh, to a future that may may never uh, may never evolve, and um, so so yeah, that's, Hypo- that's hypothetical uh, future value uh, like that. Uh, abso- absolutely <laughs> right. That's a, that's a yeah, nice. Yeah. Like, you know, you know I'll, I'll, I'll give me some of that. I'll take that if I can get like it. ingest, but seriously, like. But seriously, but again, this is this is an issue with the, with the with the entire alternative space. I mean, right? This is you know uh, you know you know this is kind of a uh, the the bastardization of. Of, of of Swansonian investments, right? I mean, you think of David Swanson over over at Yale, and I don't think this is really what he meant the industry to evolve to. But this this is where we are today. So I, I think that's the advantage that these that these non listed vehicles. I don't care what industry you're in, is that you you don't you know you're not forced to to, to, to mock to reality. Well, well, the, but maybe really quick to enter just a, maybe a point. I think what you're also saying though is that that advantage like accrues to the manager not to the investor right like that's an important important thing maybe to say if you i don't know if you agree with that or not but oh abs- abs- absolutely no absolutely yeah. it accrues yeah. to the manager. absolutely yes right to the sponsor, okay. to the sponsor. Okay. yeah in answer to your second question as phil kicked this off we started saying that the privates as the publics are eating the privates and so the uh-huh. answer to your question is how is this going to play out the public guys are still going to continue to acquire the assets from the privates Let's let's play a quick review. If you go back to uh, 2022, B-REIT started this by buying American campus communities, the last mm-hmm. student house. APTS, right as- BRG, PSB, like just QTS. go down the line, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. All right. QTS, now let's, right. Fast, let's fast forward now just from, let's say, December of last year to where we sit today. Mm-hmm. Vici buying MGM Grand in Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas. Why did mm-hmm. Blackstone yep. monetize this? Considering the age of the asset, how long they held it, but more importantly, they were able to pass off a $3 billion note to Vici at a 3.5% interest rate. Look at where current right. interest rates are. Look where the 10-year treasury is. It's a no-brainer for Vici to take down a 3.5% note in the current lending environment. Fast forward, June, acquiring a 14, Prologue is acquiring a 14 million square foot portfolio for $3 billion. Here's interesting mm-hmm. language. They note 4% cap rate on first year rent, 5.75% when adjusted to today's market values. 
I think that's a key factor there. Um, we mentioned the Simply Self Storage deal that was sold to public storage yep. this week. Why did that transaction happen? Well, the day before, Extra Space and Life Space, Life Storage closed the, their publicly traded merger, becoming the largest publicly traded self storage company. And public storage said, whoa, 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 not so fast, not so fast, and was quick to act. Obviously, the deal was going on at the same time. But since public storage lost out on buying LSI, they went and took down this massive portfolio from Blackstone. By the way, 65% of that storage portfolio is in these desirable Sunbelt markets, and that plays into that price tag for the deal. We've also got the story about Invitation Homes acquiring a, a big portfolio of uh, single family rentals from Starwood. It hasn't Starwood, been yep. consummated yet. But for those that recall, Invitation Homes was spun out from Blackstone. So basically, yep. Blackstone, again, its spun off vehicle, is buying this massive portfolio of single family rentals. And then one of the most recent transactions that closed, it's kind of gone under the radar, was in San Antonio. Blackstone selling the JW Marriott to Ryman Hospitalities. Uh, for uh, $800 million. And in the press release, mm -hmm. Blackstone notes that they had a $275 million gain on the transaction. And each of these deals that they've done, it's because they're in the money on the transaction. But what happens when you've sold off all of the in the money assets, and now you've got to raise $2 billion to hit that 2% quarterly redemption that's coming in? What do you do then? What do you do? Right. And, and, well, and okay. So on that point, perfect. And and to, I just want to add to David, when when the when when Blackstone or when any of these private REITs are selling off properties, they're not selling off the worst. They're selling off the best, especially in an environment where liquidity is at such a premium. They're selling what they can, what they can get a decent price for. And that means that you're, if you're you're in, speaking my language, Phil. You're that's adverse right? selection. You're speaking my yeah. You're speaking my language. I think language. I might have even like retweeted something that you put out on this. So so if you're staying in a yeah. fund, if you're in BRE. You're not keeping the best. You're keeping more. The private REITs are ending up. They're they're accumulating all the best assets. You know, so the, the two ways that this ends is that's one where they need the liquidity and they keep selling off the, the better and better uh, properties. The other way, the the way that that Blackstone hopes this goes is they get enough inflows to offset the redemptions, and then all of a sudden the market turns, rates come down, and 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 they go back to uh, to gathering assets. And you know, I was at the uh, NYU REIT symposium, and a representative from Blackstone spoke there, and he said that they believe that the good performance that, that B-Read has had will differentiate themselves, will lead to more inflows that will offset the redemptions that will get them out of this mess. And if you think about that, that there is the incentive to get, not that they necessarily are influencing their appraisers, right? But that certainly is an incentive to keep NAVs inflated. So are the fees. They're, They're buying fees. time. That it's, it's buying time, right? Like that, that's what it is. It's no, it's no different. Just maybe like taking a step over into my world for a second. It's, it's absolutely, you know, my, my, you know, uh, the stock I talk about the most, it's no different than medical properties trust um, doing everything it can, hoping and praying for lower rates because higher rates will literally kill them. Um, and if that's mm -hmm. a strategy, cool. But like, personally, that's not something that I would ever commit any of my capital to because hope's not a strategy. And, uh, and this thing called gravity. Sand. At least Blackstone can't afford the jet, unlike other companies that can't afford the jet. No, uh, no, no comment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna punt on that one. I, uh, yeah, Sorry, it's, I uh, yeah, it's okay. It's all right. It, um, yeah, I mean, well, no, no, but, but, but seriously though, like, if, if hope is your strategy, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm personally, as someone, and you guys too, it sounds like, like, I'm, I'm never gonna recommend that to any of my subs. That's just not. You know, that's not how we, we do things around here. So um, I don't know, Al, did you have anything you wanted to add to that or? Well, um, look, I think a lot, several really good points were already made by, by Phil and David, but it's 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 an issue and, it, and it's a, a little bit of a vicious cycle. Um, and the fact is, you know, they, they need to they need to generate, assuming the redemptions, you know, uh, they max out the redemptions of, of 2% a month, 5% a quarter, 20% per annum, that's $26 billion um you know of of property they need they need to sell you know j just to meet redemptions and then you get to the question of the of the distribution which prior to mm -hmm, the to sure. the gating I mean more than 50 percent of the distribution was in in stock was in was in kind now with the you know since then now that has started to to, to come down and the more people get concerned that they're going to you know the more they're going to obviously keep the 
keep the keep the queue uh, of redemptions uh, uh, high. They're going to start to opt for for cash instead of stock for the distribution. And at some point, some of these NTRs may start thinking about, about these distribution levels, which, as we mentioned earlier, are, are nowhere near being being covered by, uh, by 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 distributable cash flow. So it's again, it's a little bit of that of that of that circular. Uh, uh, vicious cycle uh, uh, that that's that's kind of spiraling spiraling down. Maybe they get bailed, bailed out. Very po- you know, it's possible they get bailed out by rates and everything possible. else. It's possible. But again, that's yeah. that's that's the situation they're they're in right now. So okay, so this is good because well, okay, so it's an interesting transition. Um, we have we have about fifteen minutes left, and uh, obviously, I I think um, you know we, you, we haven't talked about this since you guys listed your vehicle, but like my my suspicion is that your firm is trying obviously obviously trying to deliver an alternative but but maybe kind of like a better build a better mousetrap um and ultimately the market will decide whether or not that's true but but maybe maybe talk about like the uh the prvt vehicle which you guys just listed like what are what's the intent what's the the structure i mean obviously i I think it's a direct response to like what we're seeing now or maybe it was with a little bit of foresight but go for it talk about prvt a little bit yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. And we're not, you know, PRVT is not uh, necessarily Armada's ideal allocation or Armada's read portfolio. It's essentially, it, it's Blackstone and Star Wars. We're saying that we can mimic what they're doing from a fundamental standpoint. These are the geographies that they like. These are the property class types they like. These are the sector subsectors that they like. We can map mm-hmm. those using public reads. And by doing so, we get a few things. We can offer it significantly lower fees at a discount. We can offer it with much better liquidity and, you know, there's liquidity of the ETF and there's liquidity of the underlyings, right? Um, but but we can offer with, you know, significant liquidity in the underlyings. Hopefully, you know, the, the liquidity mm-hmm. of the ETF is, um, you know, kind of grow, can expand to meet the demand as so trading ETFs is a little bit different than trading stocks. ADV and AUM is not necessarily the right measure of liquidity. Market makers will opportunistically pop up to meet flow, to meet demand. Um, and we can help people directly if they want to execute um, at or near nav. We can help them directly with that trading. But you know, there's no opportunity to gate. This is something where we can sell at public read valuations uh, anytime the markets are open and give you liquidity at that minute. So um, you've got better fees, better valuations. Better, but re- the main thing is the valuation gap. So when you look at our 45% number, you look at some of the other numbers you guys have calculated your own, you look at some of the other uh, valuation numbers of um, of B read and what where the nav is marked now versus where it should be marked or ultimately will be marked in a you know in a free market if price discovery is allowed to happen then you know we think there's a significant advantage to switching over to this fund now a lot of people are gated and they're trapped in those funds you know it's it's almost an offboarding it's if it's in your allocation model you can replace that allocation sleeve going forward with something that's structurally better and going to give you that in you know that built in um, uh, arbitrage. Um, and if you can get money out, you know, start getting into queue, you know, you can get 5% a quarter out, you know, mm-hmm. I, I would take it, right. I would take it and start diversifying. Even if, even if you want to leave the majority of your money in there, put the full redemption amount in to get 5% out so that you can diversify just in case, Hey, that crazy guy, Phil was right. Just in case we were right. You know, you have at least some, you've taken some of the chips off the table because this is a great place, by the way, to take chips off the table. If you've been lucky enough to have been in B-Read early on, you've done very well. You've done very well. And you should, you know, you made a great trade. Nothing wrong with taking chips mm-hmm. off the table at the highs. Interesting. And so I guess um, within, if we kind of think about like the the subsector exposures to kind of to mimic the, the B-Read or the S-Read, you know, funds, so to speak, how do you how do you guys think about um, individual security selection underneath that, right? Because obviously, like if, if we're gonna if we're gonna say Sunbelt Resi, there are, there are several vehicles that um, you know occupy that space within the the apart you know the multifamily subsector of REITs. Uh, so h- how do you kind of think about selecting individual securities to to meet that exposure, but then like kind of you know. Um, I, I guess uh, risk managing that is the way to the way to ask. Sure, I'll, 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 I'll jump in, Robin. Yeah, look, I mean, obviously, sure. you got you know, at the top down level, you, you know, you see what we're doing in, in terms in terms of approximating, uh, you know, kind of the B, the B REIT model. As we get down to the to the subsectors, 
Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, 55 or 52 percent of of, uh, of of B REIT and private thereabouts are are multifamily. Now, uh, you know, we have a couple of cornerstone names that we like, but we're mm-hmm. we're we're looking at, at valuation. We're looking at NAVs of of the REITs. We're looking at at growth rates. One of the important things right now, and we touched on this your first your, your first question, balance sheets. We're still in a period where, where, where balance sheets are really, really important. I think we do get to a place in the cycle, perhaps, where we want to move out the risk spectrum. You know, we'll see what happens mm-hmm. at two o'clock. But if we get the all clear from the Fed, I think we're still a ways away. There will be a time to 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 to, to uh, play more levered reads to kind of move out on the risk spectrum. Now, still not not really the time. So we have several cornerstone companies that we really like, whether it's in industrial, mm-hmm. whether it's in, in multifamily. Now, we uh, student housing came up earlier. There's no way for us to gain some, a little bit of exposure to student housing. There was one company, uh, B Reed bought it uh, a, a year and a half ago. So obviously, we can't mm-hmm. we can't mirror B Reed perfectly, but we think we can build a a a uh, uh, an all weather portfolio of REITs with really good balance sheets, really good growth rates, and very attractive mm-hmm. valuations, and you know, building off of what we think is a very good job that their sponsor does in terms of, 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 of a thematic investment process. Got it. And and so like so I'm looking at the uh, the list and, and I mean obviously like let's let's take Resi for example. I'm MAA, CPT are the two obvious ones. I, I noticed IRT is your biggest holding, at least as of um, the last filing date. So what, wh- how do you guys think about that? Like, so it, obviously IRT is a little bit smaller. Um, it, it's a, not a roll up, but it, it had a big um, acquisition about a year and a half ago. Was it a year? I think it was a yeah, year about, a, 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 um, about that, right, right. So it's that fast. Yeah. And look, it's, it's a little bit different. It's a, it's a little bit higher levered than, than EQR. Um, so it's it's a mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's it's a little bit different strategy. I remember when these guys when the roll up came out, right? And these guys were at about uh, got 11, 12 times debt to EBITDA. Now yeah. Down, right now they're down to about seven times. You know, the other the rest. They've of the, done a good job. They've done a good job. Half times. So yeah, it's a, it's a little bit. Um, it's it's. Uh, I think they're very good operators. They stumbled a little bit with their uh, with their acquisition uh, earlier earlier last year. But I think they're back on track. They're in good markets. Um, they have a little bit of Midwest. If they're not pure play, Sunbelt, you know, some of these Midwest markets have been doing quite well. And they're at a price point, whereas I don't think they're, they get as hurt with some of the, 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 the material supply issues that we're seeing. And mm-hmm. uh, so, so I kind of like the way they're positioned. I, I like the way they operate. I, I, I like what they're doing with the with the renovations of the of the portfolio. And um, yeah, and it's uh, it's just been a, and 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 the valuation is uh, you know isn't uh, is it isn't stretched relative to, uh, to 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 what I see in other other parts of the uh, of the of the of the category. So, got it. Maybe maybe one more for me because we have about six minutes left, and this is this is the last one about like the structure and kind of management of PRVT specifically. And then I'll, I'll let you guys like, you know, finish it up with, uh, with closing thoughts. But um, so as just kind of logically, right, like as the situation plays itself out and presumably for the foreseeable future, the non, uh, the private REITs will be shrinking and selling assets as opposed to like, you know, growing anywhere near any, anywhere close to the rate that they have been growing. How do you guys foresee uh, and the frequency, well, what, what frequency and how do you guys foresee changing the weightings of the subsectors and the securities in your own portfolio? Is this kind of like your target subsector allocation or how does that evolve over time? Because presumably b is going to maybe evolve more quickly than you would like it to, I think, maybe. Yeah. Good, oh, yeah. good, good question, Rob. And, and part of, I think that one of the hardest, harder parts of what we're doing, you know, uh, in terms of executing the strategy is, is understanding mm-hmm. Um, and reading the tea leaves a little bit, just like we're doing with the public companies, right? We're, we're reading the tea leaves, right? Uh, you know, understanding what's going on, uh, understanding the financials. And, and I always preface that, look, you know, BWE's a public company. They, 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 uh-huh. they, they, they may not provide, uh, you know, they, they don't, you know, they're not as, as open as, as obviously the, the traded guys, but they're a public company. They provide disclosure on a, on a quarterly basis. Obviously, we have a monthly level. And what we need to, you know, one of the things we need to, to, to understand is as these um, uh, liquidity events continue to occur, are they doing, are they uh, 
Are they selling uh, uh, sectors or, 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 or properties uh, uh, for fundamental reasons or are they selling them uh, for liquidity reasons and are they selling the best, mm-hmm. the best of the best? So, you know, they have a, a sizable exposure still to, um, uh, to uh, gaming. Now, I think they still like gaming. I think there's a reason why, and David got into is why they, they, they monetized gaming. Uh, so we continue to maintain around an 8% exposure to gaming. BW is going to come by below VQ, that. Right? So we need to kind of think, so we need to understand what yep. they're doing and why they're doing it. And we'll, and we'll reflect that in the portfolio got accordingly. It. So you may see us deviate a little bit over time in terms of, of, of us versus 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 the industry broadly. And, and yep. there, there, that's the reason for it. So, so for that reason, we have, uh, we're actively managed. We're not passive. If we we're passive, we'd have to wait for their 10Q, their 10K, and then there'd be a long lag from deals that we're seeing on a street or that we know are coming versus when they're uh, reported by Blackstone and thus reflected in our allocations in our portfolio by being actively managed, we can get out ahead of there to better track. Got it. Got it. Interesting. Do you um do you foresee? Oh, so actually, one one this, this okay. Let, let's actually end with a, a fun. This will be a fun one. So um, obviously, <laughs> I'm uh, I I think this is just my my personal view that the only way out for no way out. The only resolution for the BRE situation is for them to collapse the structure and IPO the vehicle. Like that, that's where this is heading. And uh, because if you think about the incentive, I know this is a loaded one. If, if you think about the incentives here, right? What does Blackstone want to do? Blackstone probably wants to maintain a fee stream into the mothership. Well, how do you do that? Right? You, you, you do, do exactly that. You, that's a way to guarantee in some form, albeit at a lower dollar level, some stream back to Blackstone Topco. And then like, you know, all the, the, the holders that bought into the private shares, they sell and then there's a reset and like kind of off you go. Now, if that were to happen, how would you guys react to that? Or do you, do you think that would happen? And like, what would be your strategy going forward if, if that were to happen? I think it could happen. It's going to be an expensive process. It's going to be a long process. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, ultimately we favor, we like the public markets. We think transparency is a good mm-hmm. thing. We think liquidity is a good thing for investors. I mean, we'll, you know, we're here to provide what we think is the best read exposure to our clients, to investors in the market, the smartest funds. This, mm-hmm. We're not, you know, just trying to push this. Fund. If this fund becomes irrelevant because they take B Republic, great. It's better for the investors. It's going to, we're going to be fine. Like, sure. that's not our concern. Our concern is not, you know, we just want to make sure that that you know, right now there's seventy billion dollars of captive assets. You know, with over a hundred mm-hmm. billion dollars of, of captured real estate that that you know has no way out. In that in that scenario, there's going to be a price discovery that's going to happen, uh, which means that there's going to be, in our view, there's going to be a NAV write down, a significant one, right? If they IPO the entire B Re portfolio, there will be a NAV write down. That's that's our take sure. on it, and it'll be significant. And I think you know, like like we talked about when we were talking about the lack of volatility. A lot of the investors in this fund are low risk investors. And, you know, as much as they can get out ahead of that and reallocate to public vehicles or public assets that are giving them the same thing that they expect now, the same commercial real estate makeup, but without that same risk, I think they'd be better off. But ultimately, if we get there, that'll be a good thing for investors too. Got it. Got it. All right. So we're, we're about a minute away. Um, I got to wrap it because we actually have uh, another, we have the pitch at 11 a.m. that uh, I and, and some of my colleagues have to uh, get ready for. But, um, but Phil, David, Al, like great conversation. Always appreciate chatting with, with you guys and kind of getting your thoughts. And um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a fascinating, you know, next year or so, I think, as this all plays out. Um, so where, where can they reach? Where, where can people find out info, Phil, really quick on you guys before we before we break? ArmadaETFs.com. Um, PBAK at ArmadaETFs.com is my email. Dave and Al, the same email structure. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Substack. Uh, easy to find. Just put in my name, BAK is how you spell the last name. All right, great. Well, guys, thank you so much. Thanks for giving us your time. And uh, until next time. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Pleasure. Thank you. You got it. See you later, guys.